Ladies and gentlemen, hello, my name is Sara. Um, uh, to those of you that came to watch this, thank you very much, because it's under the category miscellaneous, and oh boy, is it gonna be goddamn miscellaneous. Because originally, I'm an archeologist and cognitive evolutionary anthropologist. I'm actually a relative newbie to the blockchain world, but uh, it completely, basically blew my brain apart, because it's something, it was an anthropologist's wet dream for like 150 years, and now it's actually happening, and it's scaling, and it's basically disrupting the world that we live in. So what I really want to talk about are the evolutionary principles that underline blockchain and why that's important and basically how that manifests in the way that um, society is going to be shaped in the future. So today we're going to be talking about whether you guys think you're altruists. Yeah, solar punk, really nice, charitable, clean air, everything. But why are we actually doing this stuff? So we're going to be asking ourselves some searching questions. Um, secondly, we're going to be talking about civilizational structure, so the way that these basic human kind of needs, the aspects of reciprocity, gift giving, how they've actually been exploited to create states that are beyond the kind of evolutionary natural, which is roughly 250 people per tribe. And to maintain something like the Roman Empire, you really need to make sure that you exploit the people psychologically so they feel like they're belonging somewhere. So we'll be talking about that as well. And I'll be talking about Christmas, because Christmas is nice, everyone likes Christmas, but it's got a very dark ritual underside that I think will be a lot of fun. And then finally, blockchain. So uh, the, the little that I have learned in the last two years, being in Parallel Polis, um, and where I basically see the biggest um, kind of pushes forward that we can implement. So you guys can go to sleep because I know that it was a wild party yesterday. For those who do not make it beyond the third slide, these are basically the takeaway messages. The fact that reciprocity is an ancient, ancient practice. The fact that blockchain is completely natural evolution. It's not a buzzword. It's not like a hashtag NFT. It's not a gif of an ape. It's actually something that is a natural kind of continuation of scaling human behavior. And finally, the fact that, well, this makes me very happy that nation states are dying. But what do we do about that? But first, some basics. Um, you might think that these things have absolutely nothing in common, but they do. Uh, for example, uh, Carcassonne. Um, uh, we went there uh, a month ago. It was absolutely beautiful. The reason, uh, the, one of the things that fascinated me most is that Carcassonne actually didn't look like this until about 1853. Basically, when the French chopped everyone's head off during the uh, revolution, then they chopped all the heads of the revolutionaries because that wasn't quite working either. So then they kind of reinstated the Bourbon dynasty. And the moment that Napoleon III came to power in 1853, he realized, well, I've kind of got nothing to give to the people symbolically because I can't give them anything from the 18th century because that's still a bit raw. Like, there's still some survivors who had their family guillotined. So can't do that. So we've got to go into the medieval ages. That's the lowest common cultural denominator. So he hired a, a guy called Eugene Violette Le Duc, um, who he basically told, you got to repair Carcassonne, mate. Um, it was actually the same guy who also repaired uh, Mont Saint-Michel, Notre Dame, um, and also um, built the Statue of Liberty. So you can really see how kind of state building, etc., and it, it was like a gift to the French people. So this kind of reciprocity, gift giving, can be seen pretty much anywhere else. Also, key terminology, it's important to know, we'll get back to them, so I won't spend time describing them now, but just bear them in mind. Social capital, reciprocity, social contract, <laughs> um, a game theory and swarm intelligence, and exchange and the concept of the gift, and whether something like the gift actually exists. So the basics of the fact that you think you're an altruist, well, first, we always expect something back. You might not think that, you might think, no, I'm better than other people, bullshit. No, you always expect something back. Um, and I think that there are evolutionary theorists who claim that this isn't true, but I'm not necessarily kind of buying that. But that's, there's one problem. We think that individualism and expecting something ba back is bad because, well, partly due to the indoctrination by the Vatican who, ba who basically associated individualism with Satanism because individualism is bad because it rots society. Absolutely not. And then that's basically where you get your left-right kind of political polarization that the, the right-wingers are for the freedom and the left-wingers are for the collectivism and yeah, like everyone's singing Kumbaya and like dancing in a circle. Um, but it's fine to want something back. And I think that this de-demonization of the fact that it's fair play between two individuals peer to peer is actually fine and blockchain beautifully demonstrates that. We also calculate the value in our heads all the time. Um, and this individualism and community, they go hand in hand, and I'll show you how. Um, so um, there'll be memes also, because I think memes are the God, best goddamn thing ever. Um, asking something from people, wanting something from people, is basically like a peer-to-peer -peer contract that we've had since the dawn of time. Uh, it's kind of originated in this Robinson Crusoe economy, like I give you two sticks, you give me a stone, that kind of that kind of thing. And bartering has been holding society together pretty much for like the last two million years. 
And you can see that there was a big kind of divergence into where this went to. Um, there were even things called tobacco nodes. They were heavily um, kind of supported by the East India Trading Company. And then finally, we got to what the academics beautifully call electronic money. Um, but you can definitely see that everything comes from one place, the need to barter, the need to exchange. However, the states are very clever at exploiting that. Um, and the states kind of now t tend to tell us, well, the gold standard is the standard. And like the dollar that we have now, yeah, that's the, you know, that's the dominant thing. You'd be crazy not to go for it. Well, if you told that to someone in the fourth century and you told them that, well, the dollar didn't exist. Um, but um, if you told them that there's going to be something else that's ever more more dominant than the goddamn solidus, they would have probably like put you into an institution because every civilization is convinced that their way of bartering, their codification of bartering is the right thing to do. Um, so much so that there, it actually became a massive political um, war of the late 18th um, and the 19th centuries. As um, Britain got very good at colonization, um, they realized that silver that was traditionally used to basically mint coins is no longer actually as good because you can have more of it and poor people can get hold of it. So, uh. so they were trying to move to the gold standard. And then like, what, there was actually even a thing called the diamond standard, which when I was working with the National Museum here in Prague, they, they said, well, yeah, well, the National Museum actually held a diamond standard that was secret, um, that was used to kind of back up the first Czechoslovakian money. Hilariously, though, it got um, stolen during communism and replaced with bits of glass, and they didn't realize until 2016. So they've literally had a com like collection of precious stones that were literally zircon and glass. But more on that another time. But you can see that the codification of value and the codification of money and kind of giving PR to the particular kind of currency has been a massive kind of status quo for states to do. Marcel Mauss, however, when he wrote Le Don in, I think, 1951, uh, captured the aspect of the gift. Um, and he said that like, where money isn't necessarily enough or where money kind of doesn't fulfill the social function anymore, you have the concept of reciprocity and gift giving. So gift giving, however, is, has a really nuanced uh, aspect of basically what you expect back. Like you do those calculations in your head. We'll go a little bit more detail uh, into this in uh, the Christmas part of this. But believe me or not, when you actually analyze it, data analyze the way people give gifts to each other and the kind of heat maps that they create, it's, absolute, it's absolutely incredible. There's this famous scene from Family Guy when they kind of describe Buddhism to people. And um, there's one guy who gives him a Lamborghini and another guy who gives him a paper clip and he basically says yes those two gifts are like of equal value to me and they just go oh fuck off like <laughs> no no way um, and there is a natural hierarchy to gifts and it, it's an extra layer of society that money cannot necessarily capture it's one of the reasons why you take the price tag off when you give someone a gift it's very rude from the uh, idea of bonton to leave it on but simultaneously it's a function that blockchain actually supports really really well and i'll get back to that at the end of the presentation uh, ultimately, it's a very simple evolutionary algorithm. You're constantly thinking about the flow of benefits and what is good for you, what is a risk for you, what's going to like, get you the best kind of optimized behavior and result that you're interested in. Um, and a beautiful demonstration of, of that is le, uh, le noblesse oblige. Um, it was basically when uh, the aristocracy, uh, of especially Britain, was expected during the Victorian era. They didn't actually have to pay that much tax, but they were kind of socially contracted to build museums, to build um, galleries, to build roads, and to basically build all the stuff that the state, which was actually pretty poor, because in like mid 19th century, um, India didn't belong to the crown. It belonged to the East India Trading Company, which was a private company, when they realized that there's money to be made there. The British Parliament <laughs> said, we'll be taking that, thank you very much, in 1873. So Queen Victoria got very rich, very quick. But before that, um, basically, like the state had to pretend like through moral obligations and kind of codifying morality attached to social gift giving or kind of symbolic philanthropy, that that is, it's basically like reciprocal altruism, but that that's the right thing to go forward. The state still gets to take the credit for it, but someone else pays, which is ideal, right? But then it gets to this, um, and it's something that I'm, I used to live in uh, Britain and America for a little while, and e this started to get really bad in 2016. This virtue signaling, because suddenly the companies realize that there's a lot of money to be made on virtue signaling. There's a lot of money to be made when you put society in a kind of like obligational contract, like, oh, we build you a museum? Oh, we change our logo to be got, like rainbow, unless it's our kind of area in Saudi Arabia? Then yeah, great, I mean, let's do that. And you suddenly 
feel somehow obligated to that and you want to pay back in the terms of essentially saying they kind of gain social capital through this and therefore they hope that their like kind of money will go up it's very very simple and it's gotten like relatively ridiculous now and I know that we can be very dubious about Papa Elon, apart from his memes, which are actually pretty good. Um, but uh, Ricky Gervais uh, is a, a comedian that is a really interesting character in this regard. And comedy in itself and humor is one of like the last bastions of like actual freedom, which I think we should protect at all costs, because it's a psychopharmaceutic. It's something that basically allows society to joke in a relatively like free space about the stuff that they genuinely find frustrating. Um, and the kind of like social justice warrior thing, it's basically latching onto perceived values, latching onto perceived moral code, uh, often exploiting it for your own good, but then also like not realizing that this has been done before and that social justice and even the linguistic exploitation of that was actually really, really popular with the Nazis as well. So um, uh, this kind of abuse of the kind of concept of objective morality and putting society into some kind of contract with you is incredibly dangerous. And that's why I want politicians nowhere near this kind of stuff and I think that the best way is to leave it to evolution and decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer behavior which is something that blockchain allows yeah <laughs> oh, how much time do I have okay we're good we're good because I, I love talking and so and I love archaeology so and I love memes so someone just throws something at me if I'm too long civilizational structure right Civilization is just a herd with material culture. Um, civilization was kind of brought forward by Latin and like the literare humaniores that we study at university or the weird ones study at university. Um, but basically it's from like civitas, like kind of population and city, but it got taken into something that's a little bit, you know, better than you guys. And especially the kind of idea of, we've got the animistic tribes who are basically dumb and play around with sticks to like, yeah, we've got civilization like with marble and shit. Um, that's an incredibly bad way of viewing like social structures tribalism is natural like we evolved our social structures much faster than we we're able to evolve our brains so it's great that you can have 3,000 friends on Facebook your brain can't handle that your brain can handle maybe 250 500 connections absolute max but like uh, civilization is basically a way of saying okay we realize that there's more money to be made or it's evolutionarily optimal for us to be a bigger group but if you've got a bigger group you've got to put some like unnatural things in process to make sure that, that group stays together so in the case of nation states it's flags national anthems, uniforms, etc., etc. That kind of like gives you a sense of belonging. And it's a very ingrained kind of concept of ritualization of belonging and identity. Again, blockchain for me at least kind of takes this away because there's the aspect of anonymization, peer to peer and the decentralization where you can create your own tribes and you're basically living as we were evolved to do, but in a way that's safe, in a way that is exciting, in a way that's scalable and in a way that's global. So that is something that really gets me going. Um, the symbolic value to uh, generate identity for free. So if everyone learns a national anthem and you can, everyone gets to sing it. Again, like it's like this thing with again you're exploiting the natural kind of evolutionary tendencies of human, so, of humans. So music is, for example, again a pharmaceutical kind of uh, psychopharmaceutic aspect. Um, it's proved that it has like a kind of binding aspect for people. That's why warriors historically, whenever they went to battle, there was usually some kind of rhythm involved, some kind of musicality. Um, uh, I. I, I did evolution of music for my for my masters, and it's a really kind of strong, ingrained thing. There's no culture in the world that doesn't sing or doesn't play anything. So then, when you exploit it by making like a national song that everyone can chant in the thousands when it's like the National Day of Liberation or some crap like that, um, then you re yeah you get people going, and it's for free, and it's free, and it's great, and all the kids learn it at school, and they place their hands like this. So it's a very clever ritualized aspect again. And uh, also the fact that building tribes isn't easy, so you need these mechanisms in place to be able to hold them. This is really grainy, but if you love uh, Life of Brian like me, you can see that um, uh, one aspect of culture um, uh, and one aspect of kind of coming together is like holding certain traditions. Um, and when those traditions are evolutionary, like the tradition of bartering and the tradition of exchange, you've, got, you've hit the evolutionary G-spot in people's brains, so that's going to be very, very profitable for you. I love this meme so much. Um, plebs literally only want two things and it's fucking disgusting. Yes, Panem et Um 
Augustus was clever. Um, he, he took a poem uh, that was done by uh, Ovidius, uh, and he basically gave people what they wanted, bread and circuses. He even did this thing where he took pigeons and kind of tied ribbons to their legs and let them free, and then the, the poor people could catch them, etc. cetera. Um, but he, knew, he was very clever. He was a new guy. He was the first emperor uh, after the assassination of Julius Caesar. So, you know, it was a bit uh, tenuous. He got rid of his two kind of um, main enemies in the second triumvirate, which was um, uh, Lepidus and Mark Antony. Uh, Mark Antony was kind of killed off for sleeping with Cleopatra, and Lepidus literally just like pissed off to Mesopotamia somewhere. And like, yeah, Augustus was very, very clever. But he also knew he was, he also knew he was new. And he knew that the Praetorian Guard and the Optimates and like all of these uh, groups in the Roman Senate wanted to be in his place because, mate, you governed suddenly an entire swathe of land from Scotland to India. Like, you had big, big power and responsibility and a lot of money. So he did several things. He kind of gave the people bread and circuses, but he also established the first ever Roman postal service because he was then in control of how information is spread, how information is distributed, the speed of at which certain messages are passed that he wanted to push forward, etc. So very clever guy. He also did uh, a great thing called like the Marble Campaign. So he started in the Forum Romanum in Rome, uh, in Rome which is amazing. You can still go and uh, lie wreaths on Julius Caesar's um, uh, where he was stabbed and people still do that, which is quite funny. I still need to pay my duty. But um, uh, he basically started bringing in marble from across the empire. Um, and the Romans were really good at uh, being able to tell different bits of marble apart from each other. So one of the, um, one of the temples uh, in Forum Romanum had 15 bits of marble, types of marble, and every bit of marble was from a different part of uh, the Roman provinces. So you could see that they were powerful just because you could see the provenance of everywhere that they've conquered. And the average Romans actually knew this. They were actually pretty marble literate. But the fact that he kind of took over a city of bricks and made a city of marble, again, it's kind of like subtly when your mum is angry with you and she kind of says, don't forget everything I've ever done for you. Again, you're exploiting that reciprocity. You're exploiting that natural thing of, I'm creating a city for you. I'm creating all these services so we can all live together in a group that's bigger than like a sub-Saharan tribe. So that's a, a, kind of a bit of like, uh, you know, um, uh, excitement, shall we? And like, maybe the, you won't feel too bad about those taxes after all. Uh, this is what I find the funniest, the social contract. Um, Hobbes and Rousseau and all these kind of philosophers from the 18th century, they basically said, well, people can't really be trusted, so we need to have in place a social contract that then uh, often evolved into constitutions. A social contract in place where you abide your duty as citizens, to the government that is creating that big kind of colossus of a society that shouldn't really be working but is because you've got the anthem, etc. Um, and then they give you, this is great, high quality universal public services. Um, and they build those roads for you, etc. And then you can feel all great. And then that's a beautiful feedback loop that kind of happens. <laughs> Um, again, um, what is however being done as a part of the kind of uh, desire to stick together uh, is that there's a lot of cartoons that kind of belittle the role of the individual. If you're an individual, you're selfish. If you're an individual, you basically like take society apart because you're pursuing your own needs rather than like thinking about the society first and foremost. Well, if you look at it like from the perspective of we're not talking about humans, what we're talking about like mountain lions or something, you can't blame an animal for wanting to survive. That's absolutely fine. And there have been mechanisms that very, very neatly in place in tribal societies, where, for example, um, if the, the king of the sub-Saharan Africa, of, of, the, uh, of the Serengeti, when they hunt a kudu, and you've got the strongest hunter in the tribe, they actually kind of really downplay it. So they say, oh, the kudu wasn't like a beast like that. It wasn't that big, just a little larger than a rabbit. It's totally fine. Hey, you guys go eat. Because he's automatically kind of lowering his position in society to take social capital, artificial from himself so that he doesn't kind of walk around the village being like, yeah, fuck you guys, I killed a kudu and tomorrow I'm going to do it again because someone would probably murder him in his hut. So these processes are natural. We're fine. We're actually really good at doing them. We don't need someone telling us like, oh, don't be an individual because it's incredibly bad for us. Yeah, it's incredibly bad for you because then it makes it difficult to get taxes out of people. And uh, that's why, and let's not forget that like, academia is very, very strongly state-sponsored. So it's going to follow these kinds of narratives. The people who follow those kind of narratives are the ones who are going to be getting grants. Um, and I'll talk about that at the end because I'm actually in the process of starting, uh, it was approved two days ago, yes, a research group. Um, and I want, uh, if anyone, by the way, has any experience with running um, academia on blockchain, I'd really like to talk to you. I spoke to someone yesterday here, which was really kind of exciting, but I'd love to have it funded in a de decentralized way. So I'd love to talk to you guys about that. 
Um, but basically what uh, academia and this kind of social aspect boil down to is that you've basically got individualistic cultures and collectivist cultures. And it's like looking at a boomer meme, this. Like, that's not true. You don't have, it's not that United States is an individualistic culture and Indonesia is a collectivist culture. That's a really kind of like 19th century anthropological kind of perception of like how you view people. Because you're viewing these countries based on the symbols that they put forward. Basically, like you are uh, like fencing in a group based on the flag and the language they speak and a national anthem. That's not how societies form. Uh, we're in parallel polis. Parallel societies are absolutely normal. They form all the time. You're a member of several societies at once. So to say that, yes, me as an academic, I'm going to say that the entirety of the United States is a highly individualistic culture. You need your degree taken away, in my opinion. Um, and that, that's when the kind of qualification and things like objective morality come in. Because of course, that what, what follows up, I don't know, this is from some cheesy presentation from, I don't know, some kind of like highly motivational uh, kind of internal course or something. But it's that collectivism is good. It forces you to work as a group. You're doing what's best for society, what's best for society. That's, that's quite a funny phrasing. Um, and families and communities have a central role. Well, yeah, that's the same thing that Marx said. That basically family is like the unit of society. Like, Please. Um, and this becomes really dangerous when um, academic so-called like official postulates become wrapped up in political discourse because that's just uh, that just becomes scary. You're basically creating like national socialism in many ways. And where that became really interesting is during the time of vaccination. Because in, when the vaccines kind of came out, um, when, because people are kind of so angry with each other, they naturally polarize because they don't want to be treated like idiots, which is absolutely fine. And what I thought was really unhelpful when kind of like all the... Uh, like, uh, I don't know, whether it was politicians or people in a position of power who somehow think that they know better than everyone else was saying, if you don't get vaccinated, you're a goddamn moron. Um, and I think it's good to get vaccinated, is my personal opinion. But I also know that someone's genome Oh, God, that is grainy. I'll explain it, however. Sorry. Um, that also my, my personal genome might, might make me more susceptible to certain aspects of the vaccine. So I might need to get a different one or I might need to get a combination. And that's fine. That's called personalization. And that's possible thanks to things like artificial intelligence. So what we do now is like current medicine is collectivistic. You're taking the right the center of the Gaussian curve and you're saying, yeah, because eight out of 10 people don't die. That's how we're going to treat everyone. Well, no, if you actually do something as simple as like uh, analyzing your DNA, analyzing your allergies, analyzing your hormone, hormone, hormone levels, um, sometimes the British accent ain't easy, um, your hormone levels, then um, you can actually um, uh, personalize the medicine that you're giving to that individual. Treating them like an individual whilst living in a society, that's fine. Those two things don't clash. But we seem to like, find it very difficult to philosophically get our heads around. And again, just if, in case you think of this whole collectivism thing is very new, it's not. Uh, that which is not good for the beehive cannot be good for the bees. Um, to take it further, the Roman architects were very, very good. In pretty much every single triumphant arch that you see in Rome or pretty much any other kind of Rome-dominated city, Palmyra, Timagad, etc., uh, Leptis Magna, you see these hexagonal things. It's meant to be a beehive because the Romans knew how the kind of um, subtle marketing worked. Because if that person walked underneath that tribal arch 50 times a day to go sell, I don't know, garum, which was this like really gross um, sauce made from uh, uh, kind of rotten fish. It was like Roman ketchup. And if you keep walking underneath this, you're going to think, yeah, beehive, good, awesome, bees. Um, it's not a, a coincidence that some of the first jewelry that was ever found um, with the Minoan culture was that of bees. Like people um, have been kind of having these like political metaphors to explain to the people why it's good about how about the kind of like an unfair relationship of the nation and the individual um, that's been here for several thousand of years. However, there are some, checking the time, yeah, good. Um, there are some things uh, that are natural to the human beings. And we're going back to exchange here, that like when the concept of exchange and basically blackmailing people about like how much good you're doing for them so you know they need to buy your product or need to pay you taxes. Um, but there are other things that are just like natural evolutionary things that everyone does. One of those things are exchange rituals. So this is the North American potlatch where basically it was a feast. Everyone got together, everyone brought out all their stuff and gave it unconditionally to everyone um, and it was this like kind of social vent that basically like once a year you had it's like the purge once a year everyone can kill everyone this was kind of a bit of a happier version of it um, everyone like you could you could get loads of really cool nice stuff 
Funny enough, when uh, the United States were being established, pot, la pot latches were made illegal because it was something that really brought together uh, no North American native communities. And they thought, well, we, okay, we thought we got rid of you with the you know, um, smallpox on the blankets, but shit, you're still trading and you're still feeling a lot of belonging. We don't like that. So um, they were actually made illegal, which is interesting in itself. It shows you the am amount of value that you have in reciprocity and how core it is as a social lubricant. And so we get to Christmas. So, um, th this, this might, by the way, I'm, I'm not like um, uh, critical of religion at all. I'm not religious myself, but I, like, if you want to believe in like the goddamn spaghetti monster, I don't care. Um, but um, th it's actually a really interesting way, the way that Christianity is positioned, because you've got Jesus is dead, he died for your sins, and so basically you can never get to the point that like that can match it, because you literally kill the son of God with your greediness. So Vatican basically has an infinite feedback loop of constant reciprocity, and the fact that like the, you're always feeling guilty. You're always feeling like you owe Jesus something because it didn't end too well. Um, similarly, you've got a very complex ritual of exchange and symbolism. And finally, um, uh, to the gift-giving rituals to create by and are universal. So it's not an aspect of Christmas. It's an aspect that is very much global, um, like, like we could see in the potlatch. Uh, so the fact that memes like this exist show you that you do do internal calculations in your head about like what you get. Like unless you've really like been born and live a Buddhist like in a Shaolin temple somewhere, you, you will kind of make that thing. So when you buy someone diamond earrings and they give you a pair of socks, you're gonna think, ugh, really? Um, like you will, you might pretend that you don't care, but you, you do. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it's very interesting to see that, um, for example, wrapping is a really important part of this. One of the things is to conceal the gift, so you can't see what you're necessarily going to get. And also there's um, a book, I'll get back to this slide in a second, Unwrapping Christmas. If I urge you to read one book, read this uh, by Daniel Miller. He talks about the fact that even the aspect of wrapping, the visual uh, kind of representation of wrapping is really, really important. Um, and there are certain cash rules around this, but I'll get to this in a second because it has, the other slide is connected to it. But I want to return to this, Saturnalia. You see, I love, I love ancient Rome. There's the parallels you need to absolutely everything. Um, the Saturnalia was uh, actually like a, a pre-Christian tradition. It was pagan. I mean, it's where um, you know, the kind of first official Christmas uh, kind of came from. It was first in 376 AD, I believe. And the, the ritual was that the slaves and the owners exchanged roles just for one day, yeah? Just so we don't have like Spartacus scenarios happening again. But the whole idea was, again, to like have this like, um, let society be free for a bit, you know? That's, that's very important. Um, and basically they would give each other gifts. Um, there would be like a lot of drinking, obviously, feasting. Um, that has its uh, importance in Christmas because it's around the time of winter, solstice and your cattle literally probably wouldn't survive the winter so you did have to kill it and then either dry the meat or just eat it so like, hey great times so the, the reasons why you have a rich um, kind of Christmas lunch or a rich Christmas dinner is literally like practicalities of being an agriculturalist in like I don't know 10th century Europe um, but the switch of the slaves and the masters is really in interesting because the way that nation states and big civilizations work is that you can't really easily hack your social position because you might have social capital, but if you're unable to pay the rent, then you, know, you can't do much with that. And, but if you give them the illusion of freedom, if you give them the illusion for at least one day, then that can often be enough that actually like, you live from Christmas to Christmas because like, once a year you're going to feel like a master. Um, and that is something that's very much uh, in the aspect of gift giving and reciprocity is very much mirrored. This is from 2021, where um, both the uh, plan to give and plan to receive, most important, was money. Now, it's in very stark contrast to these statistics from 2018, and I know we have to be kind of wary of statistics because one can cherry pick really easily, where actually the respondents and even then the calibration from the academics, uh, there was a really strong disagreement with that, that money is kind of the, the, the kind of best gift to give because like then the person has the freedom to buy anything. So you don't get socks, then you like secretly go return them and get yourself a, I don't know, Bioshock to play. Um, but um, but that, that basically like money is like more free. and. Uh, People, both respondents and the people who wanted to receive it, really strongly disagreed with that. It was before COVID. It was before people started thinking also about the structure of society and the fact that actually maybe like it'd be great if I like a couple of eats like landed in my um, wallet rather than like a pair of socks of which I have 20. Because suddenly people are in crisis and people are thinking evolutionary differently. So it's a really interesting contrast there. 
I also I love this. Um, the, the giving, which is the orange, the slide kind of temptation, it has to go towards disgust. That's, that's just that's hilarious. You have to give someone something. Ugh. Um, but predominantly, it's joy, and it's also sadness, which is also interesting. But the, the fact that you actually also get an evolutionary kick from giving something to someone. I'm going back to the like, whole altruism thing. Like, like it's, it is, it's all selfish, it's fine. Like, it's good that you're excited from like, giving something to a grandmother that she's happy for. Like, let's not demonize like, individualism and the fact that oh, you've got to be an altruist all the time and ideally like, put a little one of those flags on your like, pro, uh, Facebook profile pictures because then you'll show them you know, thoughts and prayers and things like that. Um, I know it's fine to be happy from the fact that other people are happy. Like that's like life is for living. So I know I sound like a motivational coach right now, but um, it's just interesting to see like how strongly that correlates. Um, oh yeah, I was already mentioning um, Jesus. Um, so uh, yeah, to, to have like an uh, unreachable level of uh, kind of the ultimate gift, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate heroism that you can kind of never match up to, then you know, uh, very very useful. And it has been very useful for the Vac Vatican and the Spanish Inquisition in the past as well. Um, and the fact that also uh, Christmas is again um, very strongly tied to the idea of the nation state, but we might not realize it's happening. There was a really interesting study by Miller as well, who kind of updated his book um, for uh, 2019, I believe. And he actually said that Christmas is becoming a lot more insular. Uh, th that basically, like, it used to be very global, like Father Christmas, Coca Cola truck, etc. And in the last two years, um, because uh, politics has become more populist, then funnily enough, Christmas has become more associated with the traditions of the nation state. So there's been like a regression from uh, English to the local languages. There's been things like a massive um, uh, kind of attention to, for example, baby Jesus in the case of Italy or the Czech Republic, or kind of like the really local traditions. So anthropologically, we can see that Christmas is actually becoming more kind of closed up with it and associated with the nation state, the more populous everything is becoming. So this meme isn't necessarily too valid. And I also want you to think about like the, your everyday lives. So, so this is something that actually like the study of anthropology ruined me because now I analyze everything around me all the time. I don't want you to become those monsters. But think about the way that Eat Prague, which is by the way fucking kick-ass, and I, I love it, and thank you again for being able to be here. Um, but think about how um, when you go to a stand, there's free t-shirts. They're not there just because they're free t-shirts. They're there because they want you to, to have a memory. Again, that's fine. And they want you to think, hey, like maybe this company is like pretty chilled out. Again, that's okay. Um, but you can see those rituals happen absolutely everywhere around you. Um, so it's uh, just try to be more, more wary of that. Is that things like blockchain, they're not like separated from the real world. I'm really upset that a lot of like the average people on the street, they hear the word NFT and they kind of recoil and run into a cave. But actually to, to share with people, and I think it's our responsibility as well to popularize these buzzwords and demystify them to the general public so that my grandma can use NFTs and to her benefit to hack the social system and to be an individual if she wants to and to like get, get money out of it if she wants to. Hell, there's nothing wrong with that because she's not get, getting a great pension, that's for sure, despite the beautiful national anthem that we have. But um, I just want to encourage you to do that, to kind of translate it to the ordinary people because unless it really scales, which is on a good kind of trajectory of doing and the technology matures, then we cannot really do the social change that I think that we all really want. And then finally, yes, I'm on time, miraculously. Um, I, might, I, might, I might go of course here, I don't know. Um, but blockchain is basically, um, uh, it's beyond the buzzword. I'm interested in the maturity of the tech. So we're talking about, um, uh, uh, we were talking with Galaxis yesterday, uh, and we were talking about the fact that they, they too are sick of the whole kind of like NFT scene being just like a buzzword and like pictures of monkeys. That actually the possibility to, for example, commodify and quantify your everyday behavior to like turn your assets like into digital assets, and then to be able to kind of on a peer-to-peer -peer trust basis kind of like deal with them. That that is that's the social hack. That means that you no longer have to be. Uh, this is going to sound really cheesy. You no longer have to be the slave for like 364 four days a year and then on the one day, yeah, super freedom, and then you have to revert back. It means that you can actually change your life in an evolutionary flexible way, which is exactly what happens in tribes. They're much more flexible. When they get too big, they separate and everything's fine. When like Czech Republic, like, I don't know, like the Ústí nad Labem region, which is a kind of industrial region like in the, uh, in the north, they can't say, ah, you know what, screw it. We're going to like start our own like uh, country with blackjack and hookers. They, they can't do that. Um, and that's fine. Um, I think that the nation state is slowly going to 
die. But I do think that there's a parallel world being created thanks to technology like um, uh, like, like block blockchain and Web 3.0, and then like the kind of personalization of data and services as well, thanks to things like uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I think blockchain is a technological manifestation of roughly three million years of evolution, and I also think that it, um, yeah, it hacks the social ladder uh, with, with regards to tribalism. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu, in 1971, wrote a fantastic book about social capital. Um, there's several types of capital, economic, cultural, social, and symbolic. Um, uh, cultural capital and social capital are things that you do that basically makes you appear cool, even though that you can't pay your rent. And, that, and then you can trade that social capital because people are constantly doing these calculations um, for, um, uh, for like financial services, for example. So it's being incorruptible. It's like, well, oh, okay, when influencers use the word authentic, it makes me want to throw up slightly. But um, it's that kind of thing where you are an individual, the people kind of reward you for being an individual, for being true to yourself, and then you can trade with that. Um, by getting a cool boyfriend, or by getting a cool girlfriend, or by, uh, I don't know, getting a divorce if your social capital is too low, whatever that might be. Um, so, uh, again, we were, uh, we were talking a lot with uh, a lot of the people here, and being able to, for example, turn uh, like content creation into something that is actually monetizable, um, into something that like, you don't just do that in your spare time, that actually is your job. Again, with things like um, game, GameFi, which I'll get to in a little bit, that is actually something that's possible. And again, I really want to encourage that kind of thing. So, for example, I'm, I'm really popular online, so I think it's about time I start making money out of it. <coughs> Another massive aspect is education. Um, that's the kind of like big trajectory where I see uh, blockchain helping massively because our standard educational system is, is not, not great. Like the reskilling, the fact that technology is evolving like this while our society evolves like this, there's a massive increasing gap. And then whenever I hear someone talk about like reskilling and stuff, it kind of makes me want to throw up a little bit. Um, so what I think is really important and what I, where I see it helping is POAPs, um, for example. Um, uh, I was introduced to the idea of POAPs in, um, in parallel polis and like my absolute dream would be if there was actually a parallel educational system where you get tokens basically for the fact that you either attend a seminar or you do something or you finish a project and then that that is also actively supported um, by the market and kind of agreed on with the market that that can be an equivalent to an official education I think that if we do something like that that would be a great message to the educational systems like yeah you guys fine it's like with a nation state you do your thing and we're just going to put a little bit of evolutionary pressure on you and that pressure will kill you unless you change so so uh, that's one of the things that I'm really excited about. And just to go back to this, I, I, I stole this from uh, Porn's um, uh, Instagram page because it's a brilliant meme. But uh, like philosophically, and again, I'm really not a pro in blockchain. I just want to be absolutely cl clear about that. But it fascinates me. I want to get to know more. And but because I've been working in artificial intelligence, and I think the mechanisms are slightly similar about like a massive hype. Yeah, dot AI domain. Great. I'm going to sell my startup for like 40 million dollars, or like be like Elizabeth Holmes and Terranos. Uh, I want to go from the hype to actually the technology maturing and being helpful to people. Um, and I think the combination combination of um, blockchain and artificial intelligence, but also like evolutionary anthropology can achieve that. Uh, and then finally, GameFi as well. Um, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, this is something that's like incredibly interesting to me because game theory is something that, again, is th like, kind of th like three million years old. Um, and the fact that you kind of like let people do their thing, it's incredibly scalable, it's uh, addictive because it's kind of like tokenization, you can get social, cultural, but also if you could get economic capital from that, that'd be great. So then actually my shoddy playing of Hearthstone could achieve something. And I was really excited that um, uh, when we did some videos with, uh, popularization videos with porn, um, that there's actually like like possibly in the pipeline. So that's, uh, I'm really excited that that's happening. And finally, yeah, just about on time. Um, uh, the research group that I'm planning, oh, that, that's actually been confirmed. I, I still can't believe it. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be basically studying the uh, evolutionary effect of technology on civilizations, but like throughout the course of human history, so literally going from the stone tool through electricity to um, the steam engine, etc. Uh, we've just got a really rough, we're preparing a new website, so we've got like a really rough outline. But basically what we're doing is recreating Plato's um, Polis, um, Plato's polis and uh, parallel polis gave so much to me in this regard because it completely changed my mind and my life for the last two years. Um, and so I really want to take this forward and like make it into an academic project. Um, and we're going to be recreating Plato's like, idea of an ideal society, which is of course hilarious because full of eugenics and stuff. Like Plato really wasn't as nice a guy as um, he's portrayed. It's just because all of his writings survived, so we tend to think that he was the absolute best of the best, but he also had very good PR. Um, and uh, basically put people into this 
those virtual simulation and wait for the first person to kill someone or the first person to like be on the run or the first person to rob someone. Because when you kill someone in Counter-Strike, it's like all jokes and lol. But if you actually kill someone in virtual reality as yourself, as that person, that has completely different ethical um, kind of connotations. And we want to see whether the policy is going to break apart, whether there's going to be rival po policies that are going to be basically built, whether people are going to run, whether they're going to murder. Whether, and, and we want to study that and also simulate that behavior with the help of artificial intelligence. So uh, we're getting started, and we'll keep you updated. So if any of you are interested, then like, yeah, we can talk about it more. So we went from trading shells uh, 140,000 years ago in the Blombos Cave and the Côte du Pigeon in Morocco um, that were used as kind of social capital and exchange mechanisms by our ancestors. We're now kind of talking about um, POAPs, NFTs, etc. The connecting evolutionary line is absolutely the same, um, except um, often organizations, either big institutions or nation states, have been really able to hack into this evolutionary algorithm of ours and exploit the nature of reciprocity and value to basically keep them some, themselves alive. And I think that demonstrating that we don't need those kind of structures, that we can maintain that tribal freedom whilst progressing as a civilization and having a, like a natural kind of order, I think that's really exciting and that gets me really excited as an archaeologist in the 21st century. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have both live stream co-hosts on the stage at the same time. You have, I think, about seven minutes for questions. Uh, there's a roving microphone. I'm, I'm assuming there will be many questions. Whoa, ah, yeah, one, one at the back. Phew. Uh, <clears throat> so, Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, as you said at the end of uh, your talk regarding the uh, uh, creating alternative educational system, and what do you think about uh, emerging of crypto blockchain community and academic community regarding to financing or funding uh, research, science research, and creating new, uh, no, new technology? So just to so understand properly the kind of intersection of like, uh, like basic research and the blockchain community kind of like merging so that it can be financed. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that's exactly what I don't want to do with my research group because, like, the um, politics of grants is like it's pretty sick, um, especially in uh, humanities like archaeology, which is a lot less quantitatively tangible. So I was present at many, many kind of like of these meetings where they said, "Yeah, we're going to give you a grant, but you got to talk about gender." And I was like, "Yeah, no, that's not research. That's basically just like me fulfilling something that's considered like to be morally the right thing to do in 2020. But that's not the search for truth. That's just the search for proving your point." Um, um, and uh, so I think that, e like the, but actually, like being financed by like one company as well, I, th I don't think that's healthy either. So I think like to be really pure, if I want to live what I'm actually advocating, the ideal stage is to be funded completely decent in a decentralized way from across the world, so that I can really do the research that I believe in, and not the research where like a big bank sponsors you and they say, hey, if you mention that this product is great, or that like bank again, dead, that'd be great. It's like no, I'm not going to mention that because then I become corruptible. It's incredibly difficult. Uh, we found it really difficult in uh, polis as well to like function the running of like this whole place um, but I believe that it's like the ideal thing to get to and I'll be striving for go Sarah <laughs> okay any more questions yeah we got one here hi uh, hi Sarah oh yeah sorry <laughs> hi uh, you talked about the, the death of uh, the nation state, so I uh, guess, uh, shall we expect a revolution and bloodbath, or do you see a way where this can happen sort of peacefully, naturally? Great question. Um, I think that... Um no, uh, we, I don't think that we can necessarily expect a bloodbath. Um, but it's not that because people became more civilized. It's because it's um, uh, it's more risky. And I think that people have found technology is the ultimate vent. You no longer have to drag people to the guillotine. You basically just say, you know what? Screw you. I'm not going to be using your bank. I'm going to go kind of all in into crypto. And I think that that's the revolution that the nation states didn't see until very recently, until like all the regulations started coming in, because like they see it as competition. And the only way to get rid of that competition is not to become better, but to regulate it, which is like, that's the standard kind of procedure, is basically censorship. And I think that the worst manifestation of that when it came from the European Union was Article 13, when they tried to regulate memes. That was just like, 
goddamn ridiculous. Um, so I think that the nation states realizing that they're screwed. That's why the regulation around artificial intelligence, crypto is coming into play. But I think that um, the technology world will always be one step ahead and people will kind of, it'll be like um, what, what, what you don't want to hear like in an argument or like in an argument with your parents, like I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. Like that, that, that the, we, we're just going to drift away slowly and like good luck with your goddamn national anthems. Um, and that's why, however, I think it's so important for the technology to mature and to get to the average people because like if like you know I'm preaching to the choir right now but I genuinely need my grandmother to start like uh, like investing in crypto and uh, like relying on blockchain rather than relying on the state sending her like 200 euros every month um, and I think the moment that we achieve that that's the time of like the very quiet very evolutionary revolution so yeah pretty comprehensive answer I think we've got time for one more question from down here thank you for this it was like Really amazing, this talk, so I, I love that. I'm not expecting anything back for that compliment. Um, so I was wondering... I like Scott. Thank you yeah. so much. Um, so um, do you think it's like fair or okay to use these uh, you know, manipulation techniques that nation states do if you use them to do good? Like, like in, in, for instance, like if you want to, to get people into more like, let's say, crypto tribes, and you want them to do a specific behavior, would you feel that it's okay to use these techniques? Like creating a new Christmas, but like an airdrop maybe? Ooh, uh, the, the, the ends justify the means. Um, I, I guess there's aspects of our behavior um, which uh, which we'll be doing subconsciously anyway, um, and that like you can't be critical towards everything. But like for me, it's important. It's like Alcoholics Anonymous. Like the person needs to go there because they realize that they need it, not because like they've seen a million adverts for yeah, get into eat now because like that's just like that's not the way to do it. So I think that's why I think education is the most important thing. Like if someone at the end of the day like has all the information that they need and they say I'm going to vote for communist. Yeah, mate, fine. Like, you're a free person. You go vote for communist. I'm not going to spend, like, five extra hours trying to manipulate you into voting otherwise. And it's, I think, the same thing, like, with, um, like, gaslighting in relationships. When you've got an incredibly toxic partner, you don't see it for a really long time, everyone around you tells you. But you need to, like, reach that conclusion yourself and then think, ooh, I need to leave this person. And that's exactly the kind of, uh, like, eureka moment that we need to get in society. But I think that education and, like, giving people space and freedom to do that stuff and showing that we can function for the average person, that we're not just a a bunch of technological elitist snobs who are like, you know, hodling stuff and like doing like little like blockchain things and like not really talking to anyone else. That's going to be, I think, crucial for the next stage of uh, just general adaption of these technologies. Yeah. I'm quite sure that has fully answered your question. Absolutely. <laughs> and, I, and unfortunately, we're done for time. You may see Sarah around if you have more questions for her. But uh, Sarah, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.